My name is Mark Mosley, and I have an experience within the LPGA that extends way back into the late 1990s. I'm not going to get into most of that, but I will get into a little bit. I'm here today to move you, to emotionally move you to act. And this is this is the reality that we have to, fa have to face. Every one of us starts as highly intelligent, usually very introverted philosophers. We read like crazy people, and we learn everything we can about the rights of man, the history of freedom, and what the world we want to live in look, should look like. But we all know that it doesn't. So we get together and we talk philosophy. And then we take another step and we come to these meetings. And we're here all amongst ourselves. We're all mostly in agreement. We do this here at the state level and we do it at our local level. And this, all this is foundational. It's vitally important. And, and you, should, you should continue it. But you need to understand one thing. We're also here to change the world. And the world is outside of these walls. And every one of you needs to get that. Every single one of you. And the question that I want to leave you with, nothing else today, is when will you turn and face the world and start speaking liberty into the world? How will you do that? Okay? And that's where I began, and that's why I'm here. Um, after, whenever we break for lunch, John and I are going to have a meeting over at the corner tavern. It's over here. And we're going to meet in the outside area. Okay? The point of that meeting is going to be a catalyzer meeting. I want to meet with everybody in this room who is willing to begin right here, right now, to build the momentum for the 2022 elections. Here's, what, here's what's up for 2022. You have 10 statewide races. 10. I can name, John's already named them. <laughs> um, we should be filling every one of those offices. Every single one of them. So you say, well, well, Mark, what, what about the Labor Commissioner? That's a, co that's a communist position. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no doubt. So as I call it, we have, there's going to be five commissars. <laughs> I call it, there's the superintendent of education, the Labor Commissioner, the Public Service Commissioner, the Agriculture Commissioner, and an insurance commissioner. In our world, the world we want, these things wouldn't exist. So why do we want to run for that office? The answer is because it's a platform to speak liberty into the world. You get it? So you go into the labor commissioner race and you get, you're interviewed by a reporter and the reporter says, well, why are you running? You didn't even believe in this. And you craft a liberty message to respond. And, and each and every one of us in this room can do this. So those races, there's no excuse for us to fill up those 10 races because we don't have to petition. Okay? Um, those are the statewide races. There are 14 U.S. House races. These races are almost impossible to get on the ballot. The petitioning requirement for those races are well over 20,000 petitions. There is no one in the LPGA who has done more petitioning than myself. I, and I'll speak to that more in a couple minutes. It's going to take an effort beyond anything we've ever seen in this party to actually place U.S. congressional races, candidates on the ballot. 
so what? I have a plan for that. And I'll speak to that plan, not now, but at lunch. Um, the ballot access barriers are hideous. They're nothing other than the suppression of dissent. Yeah. But they must not stop our efforts. We must not allow these, these barriers to our right to speak liberty into the world to turn into a kind of learned helplessness. So, oh my God, I've got to get 25,000 signatures before I can even participate. Bullshit. <laughs> that is bullshit. Yep. And we're going to learn. We're going to learn to get out in the world, face those people out there, and speak our message into the world, regardless of the ballot access barriers and petitions. Okay. 14 congressional. And what's the, the real tragedy about here? Remember, I've been doing this for over 20 years. The real tragedy of this is that especially for people that are new to being active in the Libertarian Party, we're best suited to run at the federal level. Yeah. That's where we cut our teeth. That's where we learn the deepest. And that's where many of us should start. Yeah. When you get into you know, the commissar, <laughs> local light races and stuff like that, it's a little bit more difficult, not impossible, but difficult for us to translate our philosophical ideas into real life policy that we can speak to local people in a way that they can understand. That takes that takes practice. We can do that too, and we should do that. And for those people who are willing to do it now, like Danny, get after it. Yeah. Do it. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you a story. In 1998, I founded the Libertarian Party in Clayton County. And we signed, the four of us got together, signed the paperwork. It was myself, I signed as chair. Martin Cowan, who you've seen here, he signed as vice chair. Um, another man showed up named Leo Baca. Remember that name? Leo Baca and his wife, Dolores. They signed up as treasurer and secretary. Uh, all this is just doing the paperwork to be official with the Libertarian Party of Georgia. All, many of you have already been through that. So we got started. And for two years, we met regularly and attracted a few other people. Not too many, but a few. And at our meetings, we basically just talked current issues and philosophy and such as that just because we didn't know what else to do. Okay? The year 2000. At the year 2000, at the beginning of the year 2000, there were two, two guys, one in Gwinnett County and one in, that was Tom Chernetsky, and one in Cobb County, Del Ritchie, who started, who began some well-organized, well-put-together, petitioning efforts to get on the ballot for state house in both those places. I went in, I went up and worked with Del Ritchie for several for a couple of weekends, learned what they were doing, then I came back and spoke to spoke that to the guys in Clay County. I says, why can't we do this? Blank faces. <laughs> I mean it's this little old us sitting around, we didn't have near the organization or the people that Del Ritchie and Tom Trinetsky had. So the convention happens. And for those of you who've been around for a while, you know, they have to get a nomination at the convention to officially become the candidate and get started. So spontaneously, Leo Baca stood up and got the nomination for his local house seat. And, you know, I got excited. I said, that's cool. But then I went and got busy with other things and I said, you know, I, I don't know what we're going to do here. And so we just went on about our business. And then some weeks later, we had a meeting, and I spoke to Leo. And Leo told me something that I, that, that 
that I wasn't aware of. He had been out petitioning on his own. Totally untrained, all by himself. He was petitioning on his own. I said, well, they have, how, many, how many signatures you got? And he said, he gave me a number, and it was about a third of his total requirement. And I said, this is magic. <laughs> We've got to get behind this. We've got to make this happen. So, you know, I started getting everybody organized. We didn't know what we were doing. We figured it out and worked real hard for the rest of the petitioning season. Short of it is, we put Leo Baca on the ballot in the year 2000 in Clayton County. So that was, so three, at that, in that year 2000, there were three candidates for General Assembly House seats in Georgia. Del Ritchie in Cobb County, Tom Trenetsky in Gwinnett County, and Leo Baca in Clay County. Okay, so we went through that, and you know, all of the candidates that running for Georgia House seat in a three-way race, you typically get three to four percent, and that's how it all turned out, but that's not the story here. The story is we did this, we transcended everything we ever thought was possible a year, a year previously. And Leo led the way. I mean, he just spontaneously did this. There was no plan here. <laughs> we were near, we were total goofballs compared to what was going on with Tom Chernetsky and Dale Ritchie. I mean, they had techies doing their database work. <laughs> and I mean, they're, that, they were they, they were the model for actually doing this. And they still are, well, almost. But, but anyway, moving on. It, it, a couple of years later, 2002, we start talking about running candidates in Clayton County again. And we said, what can we do now? And so we put together a plan. And we said, and without getting into details, we actually started petitioning for, this time, four candidates. Leo was one of them again. Uh, Doug Craig was one of them. Todd King for Georgia Senate, and myself. So we got after it. And in 2002, we were the badasses. We got all four of us on the ballot. That's awesome. And in 2006, we didn't do quite as good, but we did good. We, we actually started 2006 with, uh, we were like starting to get bigger than our britches, so to speak. And we had 10 candidates actually get nominated. About 10 candidates got nominated from the air, from the area. Uh, we ended up getting three candidates on the ballot in 2006, I'm sorry, 2004. That would be Ken Parmley, um, Bill Kochevar in Henry County, and Ralph Nobles, who was the first black candidate to ever make the ballot in the Libertarian Party history. 2004. So we got that done. And that's, uh, so to summarize that story, in the entire history of the LPGA, there have been 12 candidates on the ballot that actually made the ballot through petitioning. It's probably been double that or more that actually made an effort but didn't make the ballot. Um, eight of them came from Clayton County. In, in those three election cycles. And during that period of time, we also got, got active and started attending local uh, county commissioner meetings and stuff like that. And we actually, we did at one point check, raise a challenge to local SPLOS and defeated it. And, well, helped defeat it. There were other people. But my point to you is, regardless of where you are, in your mind, and whether or not you feel alone, whether or not you feel clueless, you must act. We must all learn. Learn individually how, what to do to turn and face the world, because that is that is our end game, to do that persistently, relentlessly, forever. Make, make those people who are attempting to enslave us, to deny us our rights, Make them work for it. Make them work very, very hard. And make them know 
that, that you've taken a stand and you ain't backing down. And, and you know, particularly in the current day, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, local militias and AR-15s and all that kind of stuff. And that's cool. I mean, if it comes to that, okay. But the truth of the matter is, most of us who understand the rights of man and the freedom ideas, most of us haven't really made the effort, haven't really given our honest best yet to go out there and make a difference in people's minds, like Spike was speaking to. And the more of us that do that, the more synergy we create. And and the more of us that do that, um, the, most, the more likely it will be we can put our AR-15s in the closet and all that stuff and just save that for another time, hopefully forever. So, <laughs> sum, summarizing what's in our face right now. We're going to go over there to the corner tavern here in just a few minutes and we're going to begin the momentum. We're going to do this right now, right here. We're going to begin the momentum to create a 20, an election here in 2022 that George has never seen before. So keep in mind, it's a time frame. One year from now, we will be well into the election season for 2022. The petitioning season will be just about half over. Yeah. It is not too late to start getting into it, figuring out what you must do. It is not too late. And I don't care if you're intimidated. I don't care if you're the geekiest geek that ever lived in, in the world. I'll work with you. Okay? So, Every one of us needs to be turned into dynamic activists. And one year from now, we will be, we'll be starting to meet mid-stride and we'll accelerate all the way through the summer and in fall. And come election day, we will create a powerful crescendo of voices for freedom that will never, ever be forgotten.